So I'm delighted this morning to be with Jenny, Jenny Thompson, who was introduced to me through Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Lokonen, Laukonen. Um, so M Mikhail from Newer Architecture and Development, and uh, Mikhail said, "Can you invite Jennifer uh, along?" I, I see your name up there, which is Jennifer, and I'm so used to thinking Jenny. So sorry. Um, which do you prefer me to call you, Jennifer or Jenny? Jenny's absolutely fine. Okay, brilliant. Um, and and Miko said, can we do a joint presentation? I'll do presentations uh, together on the 13th of September. And uh, I know Miko is one of your clients and you've worked quite a lot with Miko on one of his developments in um, Southwest London. So Jenny, you, your background comes all the way from Bartlett University or the Bartlett School of Architecture, which is based in Euston or, or, or near Euston. Um, and that's where you did your master's science in spatial planning. And just looking at your LinkedIn profile, you've worked for a number of councils, Essex, Havering and Epping. So not, not in any particular order. Uh, you've worked for a large size um, planning company. Would you call them planning or, or more holistic, Bidwells? Um, more holistic. They do property development in general. So uh, for Bidwells and then moving on to your own practice, um, which is relatively recent, since 2014, mm -hmm. you, you, I was asking you before we did the interview, just in the preparation, what, what type of units would you work with or what type of projects? And do you want to just explain to the listeners out there um, what, what size units you'd be working on? Okay, um, this year so far, um, I've got a very varied client base and caseload. I deal with everything from small extensions for homeowners that are having some difficulties and need it for personal reasons, um, large properties that have significant home extensions, um, small scale independent developments, uh, one, two, three units. And my larger caseload this year has been site appraisals for some major house builder. Um, for up to 240 units. Yeah, which uh, really, uh, it's, for me, it's huge because to be fair, you know, um, I think maybe Nicole Bremner has done something like that or doing something like that. I don't know if you've heard of Nicole's name, but she's, she's getting quite well known in the uh, London area. And I think she did something of that range in Brent Cross. Um, so you've got a background both in council and also private and I'm sure that does help you. Uh, how does that help you? And in response, how does that help your clients as well? Okay. Um, I'm able to understand very quickly because of my background, what it is that a client needs from their development, what their actual constraints are in terms of time, finance and, and product. And then I'm also able to understand on the local authority side, the process and the red tape involved. Um, which which means for the client that I can help them navigate and develop a strategy that's effective, the quickest route, and maximises their output as best possible. And, and just just to add, in terms of planning, I, 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 it's tricky to work out how many years, but two, eight, eight years at Epping, two years at Havering, and just under half a year at Essex. So that's about 11, almost 11 years, something like 11 years in the public sector, i.e. for the local councils. Now, was your experience of local councils different depending on which council you, you've worked with? To an extent and a degree, each local authority has separate idiosyncrasies, little character differences um, and political um, differences. However, the, the systems, the procedures, they're all the same. Um, so it, it's just a question of, of understanding what their particular difficulties are in that area and then being able to work with that to the best of your ability. Sure. So in, in terms of planning and developers, how, how can developers best understand what's happening at their moment we were discussing, for example, the structure of planning and pre-apps as, as one part of the structure. So now not everyone who's listening to this interview has heard of pre-apps. Um, is it possible just to elaborate both on pre-apps and what your view on pre-apps is? 
Yeah, certainly. Um, sometimes following a site appraisal, uh, when a developer has secured an option, they may move forward and submit a query to the council um, as part of a paid process with drawings and, and information to identify the council's initial opinion on, on what they think of a proposal without going the whole hog and, and trying to get an application through. So it's a halfway house. Um, the difficulty is that in some instances, the cost is can be quite high and the documentation you need can be very similar to an application and some councils can take a very long time. Um, what, when you say more. when you say a very long time what, what are we looking at three months six months or less than three months? Um, generally um, the when they were initially introduced the intention was to have them as less than three months. Many local authorities are taking longer than six months now. Um, but at which point it's quicker to do a planning application. <laughs> sure. So, what? What? And what? In terms of time frame for planning application, what? What time frame would you be looking at? And, and just, just a sub, sub, subsequent question in terms of costing. Um, what? What type of costing would someone be looking at a pre-app as well? I know there's two questions there. Okay. Um, planning applications generally take either eight or thirteen weeks, depending on the size. However, um, councils can agree with you to take longer, um, particularly if there's a committee process involved. It can sometimes it comfortably extend by six weeks. Um, in addition, in terms of pre-application fees, every local authority is able to set their own. So there, there, there are several hundred councils in the UK and everyone has a different application fee for various different thresholds. Um, so it's very important when a developer is looking at a new site that they understand at the outset as part of their site appraisal process what their strategy is going to be, what the cost implications are and what the timing implications are because that will affect things like their, their interest payments on the site while this is being considered. Okay, so look, you're almost persuading me never to look at a pre-app if it can take six months compared to a, a planning process, you know, the, um, which would take I think you said eight to 13 weeks on average. So yeah. wh when would you, persuade is the wrong word, but when would you encourage your client to do a pre-app rather than just go through the full planning process? At the moment, many local authorities are going through a process of adopting a new local plan. So they're currently running two policy sets. Um, so that's not uncommon to have an existing local plan and a proposed local plan. Um, and they're, attributing different amounts of weight to the policies of each depending on where they are in the process of adoption. Um, a pre-application inquiry if you're dealing with something on a site where policy changes would help you interpret whether or not they would apply the old or the new policy so then it would help a developer to time their application uh, and decide whether they should submit now uh, and they're likely to be successful or if they wait another year they could have a totally different response. Sure. Jenny, well, one thing which crops up quite a lot in terms of planning and speakers who've spoken at my events and also the opportunity I've had to do interviews is usually about transport requirements. That, that's the thing which comes up a lot and so forth. What, what would you say to a client who's starting from scratch, has never done a planning process before? Okay, fine. Give you a call and so forth or depending where they are in the country. Um, some of my list well, in fact i've got some of my list in cyprus so this this is only um am i right in saying the law of england wales and northern ireland and excludes scotland have i got that right or wrong yes you've got that right uh cyprus i can't know i have people <laughs> yeah so it's interesting looking at the demographics of where my youtube uh followers come from and next year is an important milestone, I think, in, in terms of planning, because the first planning act came in 1948. Is that, have I got that date right? Uh, loosely, 47, 48, yeah. 40, uh, so it came in both 47 and 48, okay. So in terms of what are the key things for a developer to know, if, if they can take three things away from this interview today, whether it's about legislation or what 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 would you suggest they take away today? The most important things I could advise a client 
before they make a site acquisition is to check the background of their site, uh, check the parameters of the restrictions, which is your policies, and, and then identify clearly what they're looking for. Um, if, if they know what they need from a development, then someone can help them work out how best to get that. But if, if there's not a clarity in their product, then it, it can be quite difficult to achieve something for them. Look, let, let, let's just concentrate on the buzzword of air rights. I don't know if you've come across air rights. Um, I don't know if you've got any particular views on there. Do you think it's such a buzz subject? Of course, you know, a couple of years ago, people were talking about permitted development, commercial to resi. Still, some people are. Um, where do you see air rights going? Do you think it's such a buzz word? Do you think it's just a lot of hot air? Um, it's a phrase I don't come across a lot. Um, oh, really? Okay. Permitted development is something that has extended significantly at the moment. It's a huge area of opportunity for developers. And e even if the proposal doesn't fall within permitted development, it often forms a very useful fallback position for my clients uh, and has been a very useful negotiating tool uh, when working with local authorities. Sure. And in terms of how best can a client work with you, you know, what are the things which are maybe fairly obvious, but maybe clients don't really consider them when they meet up with you in the initial meeting? What, what, what things are really useful for them to have ready? What type of paperwork would be useful? Um, when first introduced to a client, I normally almost interview them, similar to yourself, um, to find out what their exact needs are. Um, so if, if they can tell me what their overheads are, their minimum uh, backstop for a site, if, it, if it's three units, five units, what they need financially to make it work. Um, and if also they can be clear in terms of their timing. Some developers um, may... Uh, outright purchases and hold a land portfolio for some period of time and they're happy to wait to maximize that asset. Um, other developers have a short timeline if their finance is locked in and they can't work on other projects. So if, if speed is of the essence, that'll often affect our strategy. So again, just complete transparency about what their needs are. Sure. Okay, so one, focusing what the needs are, focusing on their overheads and so forth. Who's useful to bring to the first meeting? Do you usually ask them to bring their architect along or their structural engineer? And of course, if it's literally an extension, it may be slightly different. So who ideally would you like to meet in the first meeting? In the first instance, um, usually it's useful to meet the developer and architect to have some form of discussion or, or their surveyor. And if they are a partner to the project, the landowner as well. Okay, so in terms of your stronghold, your base in Essex, um, now let's say there's some people listening to this interview, maybe based in Essex, um, mm -hmm. thinking, look, we don't really have a huge team. We've got no uh, architect as such. We don't have a structural engineer. Uh, you know, they've got the finance to do the deal. They've got the land. Can you help as well? or do they have to have everything else in place before they meet you? No, I, I, I bring a, a little black book of contact. Um, if there's someone you need, I can probably find them. Okay. <laughs> so what, whatever yeah. your project needs, I, I'm likely to be able to identify and offer you a range of consultants as well. Sure, okay. Uh, and would that mostly be in the Essex area or would you be able to you know, have a bit more wider compass? Um, I have a project at the moment from Maidenhead, uh, Owlsbury Vale, to Coram, um, over towards the south east in Kent direction, um, and then across London as well. So pretty much London. Oh. Jennifer, are you still there? East, anywhere in that area. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I lost you there for Hello, about, ben. yeah, I, lo I lost you there for about one one minute. So just, just oh. to summar summarize, you've got projects based in the f Maidenhead, in Kent, and other locations in the home counties. Is that more or less right? Yes, and yep. in London, yeah. Uh, yeah, London as well. Um, 
I, I know you've got projects in southwest London. Is that your main stronghold in, in London or would you have projects across London as a whole, which you've done over the last three years? Oh, Lani. Um, <laughs> over, over the last three years. Is that um, quite a... <laughs> um, Havering, Redbridge, um, Lewisham, Merton. Um, I'm trying to think where else. <laughs> um, Generally, I mean, every every London authority is, is different. Sure. Um, but that being said, the, the issues and the strategy, you follow the same principles. So it's a question of just working through with each council. So, Jenny, before we conclude, what 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 will be the takeaway on the 13th of September? Um, I'm hoping to demonstrate to your your forum how bringing a planner on board can make a significant difference to the strategy, the timing, and whether or not they get permission, which is frequently the case for my clients. They, they, they were getting refusals and nowhere, and, and when I'm on board, once we've started negotiating with the council, working through what the issues are and, and, and identifying some of the options for them, they are walking away with profitable projects. Okay. Look, some people may not be able to come along because it's a morning meet. Um, how, how best can they connect with you if they can't make it? Is there a website which you have? Yeah, I'm online at www.thompsonplanning.co.uk. I'm on LinkedIn, Jenny Thompson. I'm on Facebook, Thompson Planning. Um, and generally, um, for yourself, Miko, or like I said earlier, word of mouth, um, uh, anybody that works with me once generally comes back and works again. Sure. <laughs> uh, and Thompson is T H O M P S O N. So, um, it is. Yeah. yeah. Look, Jenny, I just want to say a massive thanks. I look forward to seeing you on the 13th of September, which isn't too far away. I think it's literally in, I hope I've got my maths right, about 15 days' time, something like that. It's, it's not that far, though. So, huge thanks for taking time out. I look forward to seeing you. Look forward to seeing uh, Mikko Lappen and at that particular uh, meet as well. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you.